My thanks very much to the uh, Georgian Foundation for Strategic and International Studies, uh, to the um, uh, SAM Strategic Studies Centre in Baku, and um, to the Centre for Strategic Research at the Turkish Ministry. Um, it's always good to look back, and we've just heard somebody looking back 30 years. Well, I'm going to take you back even further, about 40 odd years ago, when if you went to Turkey, you took your own coffee with you because the trade regime was so poor. Why then is Turkey now in the top 20 of world economies? What's happened? The answer is, it's had to import energy. Why is that important? because it had to import energy in large quantities at a time when the energy price was rising. And to do that, it had to boost its export trade, which it did. First of all, the development of white consumer goods, the role of construction companies in the energy producing countries of the Middle East. With the result that when oil prices then collapsed, in the 1980s, Turkey had a much more sound industrial export oriented base than it had 12 years earlier when prices started to rise. I have always argued that it is much better to be an energy importer and have to pay your way than to be an energy exporter <coughs> and live on the benefits of royalties that are, to a certain extent, unearned. This creates all sorts of things. It means that you've got two of the three countries here, Turkey and Georgia, as essentially importers, in an equation with the country, Azerbaijan, whose enormous dynamism of the last 20 years has been fueled by an energy export boom which has rendered Azerbaijan in danger of becoming a rentier state. It may well be that a reduction in energy prices is what forces Azerbaijan to really develop its non-energy economy. And that is what is necessary if you are going to really see a large-scale boost between trade between the three countries. Having done that, let's go to energy and the problems that the region faces. At the moment, there are two main subjects for discussion and they are interconnected. One, simply starting with it because it's an older concept and project, is the development of the Southern Gas Corridor. It is the development of the Shakhtanis gas field upstream, the extension pipeline to the Georgian border with Turkey, the TANAP pipeline across Turkey, and the TAP pipeline to Italy. This is happening. The projects are mostly contracted already. And although there's a problem with TAP, it ought to be noted that while TAP has yet to receive environmental approval from local authorities for its landfall, the group has promises already from the Italian government that it will overrule the local authority ruling. And that that implementation of the Italian government override will take place within the next couple of months. What are we saying though? Essentially, the Southern Corridor, according to Sokar CEO, Rodna Gabdalaya, is a $48 billion project. Half of that is upstream, half of that is pipeline development. That's an enormous amount of investment. And there are problems. Because it is designed to be so large, 
in order to have capacity not simply for the Chateauneuf Stage 2 project, but for further gas to follow later. There is always the question of how long will it take to fill the pipeline to the full capacity. And if the pipeline is not filled to full capacity, what damage does that do to the project's interim or medium term commerciality? But, as I say, the most important element of all is simply the project is physically under construction with contracts for pipe and contracts for construction issued in the case of both the operations required for Azerbaijan, Georgia and Turkey and the fact that they have yet to be issued for TAP is far more a reflection that TAP will not be needed for a further year after Tanak Benka's service than anything else. It's just simply a matter of scheduling. It is important to notice, for instance, the TAP is actually engaged in land acquisition in Albania and Greece, and you don't know that if you're not going to go ahead with the project. But then there's the question of Turkey Street. Russia, as we know, has long sought to find ways to bypass Ukraine. It was going to do half of it by North Stream and half of it by South Stream. And then in December, in effect, Mr. Putin said South Street would not be killed, although that's the word he used. It would be transferred and become Turkey Street. Same capacity, three quarters of it, indeed, is the same route across the sea. Just a landfall slightly to the south of the Bulgarian border with Turkey instead of slightly to the north. But there are fundamental issues that it raises. The first, be under no illusion, it is going to be built. Why do I say that? Because of two major factors. One, last year, Gazprom signed contract worth more than 6 billion euros for pipe manufacture and pipe laying with major European companies. In addition, Gazprom is in the middle of an incredibly expensive $22.5 billion program, which it confusingly calls the Southern Corridor, to bring gas from the north of Russia down to the Raskaya compressor station on the Black Sea. And you don't do that unless you're planning to export the gas at the end of the system. We also know that they have already, in effect, not merely signed the contracts for the first two streets, but they know what they're going to do with most of the gas that comes through those first two streets. A string, incidentally, is just simply a piece of pipe that lies next to a piece of pipe. So we talk about Turkey Stream as if it's one single pipeline. In fact, it's four separate pieces of pipe side by side each one which we call a string. The first string, just simply, it'll go to Istanbul. It'll be plugged into the existing network as soon as it touches ground, and almost of all of it will go to Istanbul, replacing much of the gas that comes down through the Balkans pipeline. A little bit of it will be used to serve local customers, possibly in Bulgaria, possibly in Greece. Then you get the second string. Again, a little bit of that will go to Istanbul. But there's going to be about 10 or 12 BCM of that that's going to need a new home. And the logical new home, and the Russians have said this is what they're thinking of, is the European Union. What is interesting is that it's not good enough just to land the gas on the shore of Turkey. You have to get it across to a point at which you can enter the European Union. And the Russians have chosen exactly the same crossing point as the whole southern corridor. Namely, Ipsala on the Turkish side, or Kipoi if you want to use the Greek counterpart. This raises the question, 
concerning European rules and regulations. Because the TAP pipeline is being built in a Schnittau 10 DCM capacity. But eventually, just simply by adding another compressor station, so to have a 20 BCM capacity. And that second 10 BCM is open under European regulations to anyone who wishes to put forward a commercial bid. And the most important thing about this is that Russia, Gazprom, is the only country in a position to put forward a commercial bid for use of that 10 BCM before any further gas can come on stream from Azerbaijan. Is there anything in the EU to stop it? No, if you want. I've checked with European officials, and indeed one European official publicly stated this a few days ago, Mr. Brendan Devlin of the DG Energy. So Russia, if it wants, has access. But what does this do to the Southern Gas Corridor? If Russia were to take 10 BCM, and I suspect at some point it will come to the conclusion that it makes sense for it to do so. This poses a challenge to the Southern Gas Corridor developers, but it doesn't automatically translate into a threat to them. What am I talking about? Well, first of all, of course, it achieves the immediate commerciality of the trans adriatic pipeline, the TAP pipeline, earlier than expected, because it's then carrying 20 BCM, not 10. So that's good for the developers of that one. On the other hand, it delays the additional gas that might go into the TAP pipeline because there is no outlet for the extra gas that would go into the Tanak pipeline. So it would damage the commerciality of Tanak, and the commerciality of Tanak has always been the weakest link in the entire Southern Gas Corridor project. But is there a way out? Well, there are several people looking at one. Last week or so, maybe a bit earlier, uh, the Prime Minister of Bulgaria said, can't we revive the book of West? The Slovak transmission system operator, Ustream, wants a project called Eastream, which looks remarkably similar to Nabucco West, except that instead of taking gas to Austria, it would go up to Slovakia. And then BP is again, I understand, Justly Moffitt's proposals for SEEP, the Southeast European pipeline, which would aim at working out how can you best gasify the Balkans. More to the point, the European Union is very, very active in promoting a series of interconnectors in the Balkans. It wants to see the completion, the uh, uh, signing of a contract this year for a 5 BCM pipeline to connect Greece with Bulgaria. Not that Bulgaria needs 5 BCM of gas, but if it's got it, and if you do some minor modifications to the Bulgarian system, you can then start extending that to serve other countries in the Balkans. What is needed for the period after the first 10 BCM reaching Europe from Chattanooga to in or about 2020 is a proper program for development of gas pipeline connections in the Balkans, starting more or less at Ipsala Kipoi. That is perfectly doable, but as I say, it's a challenge because it still needs to be done in a way that people thought that the TAP system provided that answer, but it now may not. What's the long-term consequence of this? It's very simply that Turkish Stream will take place, but it won't stop the Southern Gas Corridor, it won't stop the Shaftanese development, it won't stop the 
South Corps has planned that expansion. It won't stop Tanner, but it certainly won't stop Tanner. But it will pose challenges to them. And it will cause issues for any other countries like Turkmenistan, Iran, Northern Iraq, the Eastern Mediterranean, Israel, that might seek to put gas into the system. So there are long-term implications, but there is not, I think, a long-term threat. Thank you.